This is actually one of his uh, old Sonic cups, if you're wondering why I've got it. Figured I'd need a little bit of water because I was going to do a lot of talking. For those of y'all who know me, I do tend to ramble, so I'm going to try to stick as close to the script that I typed up so that I don't keep y'all here too long. I never imagined that the first time I would see all of my friends and loved ones regathered in this church would be under these circumstances. My father had always told me that when he died, he wanted me to officiate his funeral. But I never imagined that it would be my first funeral, nor did I imagine that it would be so soon. I never imagined that the first funeral I would ever officiate would be the funeral for my father and my best friend all at the same time. I never imagined standing behind this pulpit, up on this stage, saying the words I'm about to say. But here you are, here he is, and here I am. I can't particularly say that I enjoy the reasons for our gathering here today, but I will say that I'm eternally grateful for your presence, grateful for the opportunity for us to be together, and grateful for the comfort that you provide. For those of you who have been praying for my family and me, I can't express my gratitude enough, for we have hourly reaped the benefits of those prayers. God has been faithful, and his grace has proven itself sufficient, so I thank each and every one of you. I don't think that I have to stand up here and say a whole lot about my dad, because if I did, I'd quickly turn into a blubbering fool who had uh, tears all over my notes and snot running down my face, and I want to spare you all that image. We've heard people up here talking about him, and if you're here, it's either because you knew him and how amazing a person he was, or you knew one of us who's been affected by him. Either way, you've met my dad, because every single person that he knew was affected by him. As for me, I can say that David Lee Tate Sr. was my best bud, my dearest pal, my closest amigo, and my truest friend. We shared names, we shared houses, and we shared the most beautiful woman in the entire world. He had her as a wife and I have her as a mother. He was the best dad a man, the best dad a boy could ever ask for, and if you met him, you knew that. If you saw us together, you knew how close we were. All my life I've been a spoiled brat, and that's because God, by his grace, has given me the best parents a kid could ever ask for. The best. There are plenty of parents that this world has to offer, but there are no better parents than my mom and my dad. I don't know what God was thinking when he gave them to me, but I am so grateful that he did. I'm not blessed. I'm spoiled because I have the best two parents. But like I said, I don't need to talk about my dad because I could. Right? I could just share a bunch of memories. I could stand up here and I could talk about singing Hank Williams or Aerosmith or Elton John with him at the top of our lungs as we drove down the highway. I could talk about the time he threw his Sonic tea out the window while we were still in the Sonic parking lot because they accidentally gave him sweet instead of unsweet. And I wish that only happened once. <laughs> I could talk about hundreds of hours driving through the state of Texas or flying across the nation as he took me to karate competitions. I could talk about the countless hours he devoted to watch me train in martial arts from East Coast to West Coast and all through the land. I could talk about the tens of thousands of photos he took at all of my races over the years, from Chicago to California to Hawaii to Scotland. We were all over the place. I could talk about the playful banter he'd share with my mom and how, even though they didn't know it, sometimes I would sit in the kitchen and set aside my homework to just listen to them talk back and forth in the living room and admire the loving relationship they had to see how beautiful and loving their marriage was. I could talk about his selfless nature, how his number one hobby was striving to make other people happy, how he wouldn't hesitate to inconvenience himself if it meant helping someone else out. I could talk about our last family trip to Costa Rica, or I could talk about our last father-son trip to the Grand Canyon. I could talk about our endless hours working out together, enjoying the sun, going for bike rides, or just sitting at home watching one of the hundreds of TV shows he loved watching. I could talk about my first memory of him, handing me a lime when I was somewhere around one year old, the first and last time I ever ate a lime, because it was so sour. Or I could stand up here and talk about my last memory of him, riding our bikes together through the woods, laughing and joking and having a great time until only moments later. Due to a freak accident, I held him in my arms during his final moments. 
I could share more memories. I've got 22 years worth and he was there for every single one of them. But like I said, I would quickly turn into a blubbering fool. I don't want any of y'all to see that. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to turn us to scripture because that's the only place I know where to turn. In 2 Samuel, King David, in the midst of heartbreak, was faced with a decision he had to make. His little baby, his little newborn baby was dying. And while the baby was sick, David began tearing his clothes and weeping and mourning. The story proceeds as follows. On the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him that his child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and he worshipped. He then went to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me? The child may live. But now he is dead. Why did I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him but he will not return to me. You see, David mourned for a time, but once God had made his decision, David arose and he worshiped God because he trusted that God knows best and he believed that God was worthy of his worship. Like David, we find ourselves in a very similar situation. A loved one has perished. What now shall be our response? God has made his decision. Now we must make ours. The God who gave us my dad has chosen to take him. One moment we were enjoying a fine time riding our bikes through the woods and a few seconds later I held him in my arms weeping over him, kissing him, crying out for help and singing to him. Do I understand why God took him? No. But do I trust that God made the right decision? Absolutely. You see, God giving me my dad was one of the most gracious blessings he has ever bestowed upon me. If that same God who gave me my father has chosen to take him, I trust that his decision was motivated by the same gracious love. And in that decision, I will rest secure. And I think we all should. As I said, God has made his decision. Now we must make ours. There are three main things of which I am confident, of which I am certain. Three things which I want to share with you today. And the first thing is that death comes for all of us. Everybody, every single one of us is making our way to this casket. All of us. We're all one day headed to where my dad now is. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death and that no one is righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And as sinners, death is where we're all headed. Every single one of us. We've all rebelled against the author of life, and to separate yourself from life is to run to death. We find ourselves quarantined due to COVID-19, due to the coronavirus, but I tell you the truth, the coronavirus is not the illness we have to worry about the most, and death is not our greatest enemy. Sin itself is the greatest plague, and sin is our greatest enemy because it's sin that leads to death, and we're all sinners, and we're all headed there. We are all sinners, and so death awaits us all. The second thing of which I'm confident and which I want to share with you is that death can come quickly. I always knew this. I think I understand it a lot more now. Uh, You know, I would lead Bible studies, and I would tell people, you never know what tomorrow brings, because that's what the Bible says. Uh, But now I've come to see that you don't know what the next 10 seconds bring. My dad and I were laughing and joking with each other one moment, And 30 seconds later, I was cradling him him in my arms, crying and calling 911. That quick. In my journal that morning, only a few hours earlier, this is what I wrote. 
first day in a while where I haven't had any set plans. It's weird. I had finished my uh, previous semester the day before. The first day in a while where I haven't had any set plans. It's weird. I thought it would be nice, but it feels lazy. I'll probably play some piano, sing some worship, and read Peter Pan until my dad gets home from fishing. When he gets back, I might see if he wants to go ride bikes or something. I spent that morning reading about a boy who never grew up. I spent that evening recognizing that all of us have to grow up, and that one day death will come knocking at our door. You might be laughing and enjoying the day with your best friend one moment, and ten seconds later, you may be gone. You do not know what tomorrow brings, and not one of us, by stressing, can add a single hour to our life. And I know what you're thinking. You're hearing this and you're saying, David, I thought this was supposed to be a celebration. I thought we were going to be celebrating your father's life, but everything you're telling me is depressing. You're saying that death comes for all and that death can come quickly and unexpectedly. And you're saying, where's the celebration? Isn't this supposed to be a celebration? And I'm going to tell you, yes. I told you I have three points, not two. Because <laughs> it's true. Death is coming for all. And death can come quickly. But the third thing of which I am confident, the third thing which I want to share with each of you, is that death is not the end. It's not the end. Earlier I said that the wages of sin is death, but thanks be to God, that's not the entire verse. If you want me to read the entire verse, I'll tell you it's this. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't believe that my dad is truly dead. I believe that his body is dead. But I believe that my dad will always be alive. Because the Bible tells us that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I believe that in Jesus Christ, though death comes for all and death can come quickly and unexpectedly, we have no reason to fear death. Rather, we can cry out through him, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? He became sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I believe that in Christ there is a hope beyond the suffering, a joy beyond the tears, a peace in every tragedy and a love that conquers fear. I have found redemption in the blood of Christ. My body might be dying, but I'll always be alive. If my dad had to be taken from me, if my dad had to be taken from us, I pray that he was not taken in vain. If my dad had to die, I pray that it will be for the glory of God and that by his death, many will come to life. If it took my dad dying to get each and every one of you in here to hear the words I'm saying to you, well, then I think it's worth it because the gift of God is something that's beyond our imagination. And I want to extend that to each and every one of you. Let him not have perished in vain, but hear the message I'm sharing with you and be welcomed into that life. I do have some requests, though. Firstly, I don't want you to just come to Christ because you're afraid of death. That is a good motivation, but I don't want that to be the only motivation. Secondly, I don't want you to come to Christ because you want to get out of hell free card. That's also a good motivation, but I don't want it to be your only motivation. The reason I think you should come to Christ, the reason I think that you should look up to the body of the nail-pierced Savior who died for us and raised up for us. The reason I think you should come to him is because he's worthy. That's the reason you should come to Christ. Today we mourn my father in his passing, but as sinful men and women, death is the wage that we've earned. Do we mourn it? Absolutely. But at the same time, we've earned it. That's where we're all headed, and it can come quickly. The reason we come to Christ it's because he's worthy. Let us remember Jesus Christ, God himself, the author of all life, who took upon himself the death we, that he did not deserve so that we could have the life that we did not deserve. That's why he's worthy. He didn't have to do it, but he did. He gave his life for us, and he came back to life so we could be resurrected with him. And he now sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalves. That's somebody worth trusting. 
Have this mind amongst yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's the type of God we serve, and that's a God worth serving. Christ lived, he died, and he came back to life so that you and I need not leave this funeral in anguish, but in hope. In Jesus Christ, death does not get the final word. Place your faith in him because he is worthy to be trusted, worthy to be praised, worthy to be loved. It's all about him. It's not about us. It's all about him. When God took my dad, he made a decision that many of us, including myself, might not understand. But we have to ask ourselves this. Is the God who took my dad the same God who loved us so much that he gave his only son to die for us so that if we believed in him, we would not perish but have eternal life? Because if that is the same God, then I believe he's worth trusting. And I'm not going to leave here in despair. And I'm not going to leave here without hope. I'm going to leave here in joy. And I'm going to do what my dad always said. Keep a smile on your face and don't let anybody steal your joy. Because it's not the end. We have a future hope in Christ. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In Christ, we have everything we need. Without Christ, we have nothing. What does it gain a man to, profit, to, have the whole, like to have the whole world but forfeit his soul? But if you have Christ, that's all you need. And we can leave here in joy. We can leave here happy. We can leave here singing. And we're about to. I've lost my dad, but my heavenly father is still with me, and he beckons you to him as well. And so to close this out, I'm going to finish how I began. As David, in the wake of his little baby's death, let us not leave this place in sorrow, but in praise. God has made his decision. Now we must make ours. Now I'm going to walk over to that piano, and uh, we're going to sing a song. I need my water to do that. This song is actually from uh, the most recent album I released. Y'all can hear me, right? Yeah. Uh, this song is from the most recent album I released. My dad loved listening to it all the time. And this is actually the song I was singing over him in his final moments. Um, after the bike wreck, while we were in the woods, and we were all alone, and I held him in my arms, and we were waiting for the paramedics to arrive. Uh, this is the song I sang over him, but I don't... I don't want this to be a song that makes you sad. Rather, I want it to be a song that helps us leave this place in worship and just in love with the God who gives and takes away. So, um... Father, 
I'm drowning for I am but a man the world around is oh so dark help me shine bright as the sun not my will not my will not my will but yours be done father i'm tired my body cannot sleep father i'm Not my will, not my will, not my will, but yours be done. Father, if I must drink this cup, then I will count it joy. Father, there's nothing I want more than to be of your employ. Just give me strength to do your will, cause I can't do it alone. But not my will, not my will. Not my will, not my will, not my will, but yours be done. God, I thank you so much for my father's life. I thank you so much that we have the opportunity to gather here today and celebrate it, and I thank you so much for you. I thank you so much for giving us your son. I thank you so much for the grace that motivated you to reach out to sinners like us and offer us salvation in your name alone. God, as we leave here, let us not leave here without hope. But let us find hope in you, knowing that though death comes for all of us and though death comes quickly, death is not the end because you have power over death. God, I love you. I thank you so much that you have given us the opportunity to have spent the time with my dad that we got. As we leave here, let us rejoice in you and sing our praise to you. It's in your holy and mighty and worthy name that we pray. Amen.